everybody and welcome to the atheist experience i'm your host russell glasser and with me today is jen peoples hi how are you good welcome back jen thanks today is sunday february 28th 2016 we are a live call-in internet-based atheist tv show broadcasting from austin texas dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state you can catch us live every Sunday on YouTube or on Ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com. You can also provide feedback by commenting on the official show blog at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP. You can also email us at tv at atheist-community.org, and you can join in the Atheist Experience official discussion group on Facebook. If you enjoy this show, please check out our related podcast, The Nonprofits, currently airing on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. You'll find links on the Atheist Experience website, and the next Nonprofits will be recorded this Wednesday on March 2nd. As always, the cast and crew of the Atheist Experience will be going to dinner after the show at Threadgill's North Location. The address is 6416 North Lamar. Uh, all viewers are welcome to attend. It will be arriving after the show sometime around 6.45 p.m. or possibly a little later. How are you doing, Jen? Hey, not bad. I uh, noticed that the blue bonnets are blooming in Texas right now. So. Oh, that's one of the best things about living here. Oh, yeah. Well, that and uh, someone on my Facebook feed reported walking into her backyard and smelling the smell of grape Kool-Aid, which means that <laughs> okay. the Texas mountain laurels are also blooming. So. Hmm. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they smell like grape Kool-Aid. Got it's it. pretty cool. Uh, what's, um, got anything uh, to talk about this week? Yeah, we actually, we got an email oh, from a guy. we get email. Yeah, we get some email from time to time. This guy is an anti-vaxxer, mm -hmm. and he, he also um, says he's a skeptic and he's got an open mind, so he wanted to test his beliefs. Yes. And so what we got in email was actually um, a kind of a textbook case of confirmation bias, which... He uses um, in a really concerted right. fashion to demonstrate that he's not wrong. Yeah, I should say that this is one of many topics on which people will write to us frequently uh, and say that he's a true skeptic and we're unskeptical, yeah. and then lay out a position which is like blatantly anti-science. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there, we have a lot of those. We could cycle through them, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> This and it, week's is anti-vaxxers. And on Twitter and on Facebook, I promised that we would slaughter your sacred cows today. So mm -hmm. if one of your sacred cows is that this show should be purely about atheism and nothing else, uh, that sacred cow is about to meet an untimely death today. That's a weird thing to make sacred. <laughs> That's right. Um, anyway, the guy, um, he, he basically directs my attention back to a show that I did with Tracy that was on conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. and it was about you know some basically some steps you can take to determine if you know um, your conspiracy theory makes sense and so his first question is are vaccines more risk than reward and in this case he concludes that uh, they're not more risk than reward. Wow. So I was, On what basis did he come to that? I was conclusion? encouraged by this. And then I realized he's completely misunderstood what we're talking about when we say vaccine risks. Mm -hmm. He thinks it's the risks to the pharmaceutical company for liability. What? So already we have this fundamental misunderstanding about what the issues really are. The risk when we talk about vaccine risks are risk to the individual taking the vaccine not the risk that the pharmaceutical company is going to incur some financial liability um, as a result of people using the vaccine. And then he goes on, uh, the next question was, does the theory explain more or less of the available information? And from that he leaps right into vaccine side effects. Mm -hmm. um, never mind that the relevant theory here is germ theory. Right. <laughs> and it definitely explains why vaccines work. 
Can I take a second to give some background on anti-vaxxers? Yes. Just in case people are hearing this for the first time. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are groups of people who believe that uh, the injection of vaccinations into kids and adults is part of some big pharmaceutical conspiracy to separate you from your money instead of a well-established uh, medical practice uh, which is intended to, <laughs> sorry, uh, w uh, which is intended to basically give uh, herd immunity to a large group of people from very common diseases, which is why we no longer have uh, very common cases of things like measles and smallpox, which used to kill a lot of people. Um, yeah. But there, are the, there's this faction of people like this emailer who take exception to that idea because they, they have been swayed by junk science, which uh, is often pushed by celebrities, that says that this is just a big money-making scheme, and also it will give your kids autism. Not yes. true. Yes, autism and lots of <laughs> other things. It's putting toxins and all kinds of things. He doesn't make that claim, but he does mm -hmm. go into the profit motive of the pharmaceutical companies. Right. And when I pointed out that there's really not much profit in vaccines, um, that, that basically, you know, the government has to um, essentially provide some incentives for companies to even produce them, otherwise we wouldn't have them. Um, he points out that, that um, there are, have been some rather well-known mergers of uh, different vaccine or uh, different pharmaceutical companies. And oh, by the way, this other company, they make a lot of vaccines, so there must have been some incentive in there. Mm -hmm. Never mind the fact that they, most of the incentive is for these very high priced other drugs that they're making, and it's not the vaccines right. that's, that's driving this. The, the fact that there is a profit motive I, motive, I feel like, is a really weak fallback it, it that is. every conspiracy theory lands on because. I mean, you can use that logic to dismiss almost everything that right. people do. Uh, you know, science itself is most, you know, you have to pay money to actually investigate things. If there's a, sh you know, a TV show, uh, you know, of course the TV show is usually on to make a profit, not with, say, well, <laughs> I mean, sometimes yeah. just take in enough in donations to uh, break even, but, you know. Yeah. Well, and, and it overlooks the fact that if you really wanted to make a profit mm -hmm. uh, on something, you'd get into the supplement market, which is oh, yeah. extremely poorly regulated. And, you know, if somebody does get injured, there is no equivalent to the vaccine court that people can go to if they get injured by a vaccine. Um, and vaccine court is something he brings up. And, uh, you know, as, as sort of, um, you know, Here's another reason why it's low risk for the pharmaceutical companies. Well, that's one of the incentives that the government provides for pharmaceutical companies to manufacture vaccines in the first place. And it's because we know that anything that has an effect um, can also have a side effect. And sometimes people do have side effects from vaccines. And when that happens, they are entitled to some kind of reasonable compensation. Um, the fact that the government has put all these vaccines on a list of mandatory vaccines in the interest of public health, um, it just stands to reason that the government should pay for the vaccine court, right? You've got a government program, it's considered mandatory by the government, um, and so, you know, why shouldn't the government fund the vaccine court? Mm -hmm. And I know there's gonna be like a ton of civil libertarians or whatever, or big L libertarians who will foam at the mouth over that, but. You know, that's the reality. I mean, we have uh, mandatory vaccines. Uh, the government subsidizes these. It's a public health issue. And so that's why we have it. Um, the fact that some people are injured and are compensated through this court is not a mystery. Um, there's nothing conspiratorial about it. You, you can read about the results of the vaccine court. You know, it's public record. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why that um, has anything to do with the argument here. But overall, he concludes that um, this is not risky, and therefore, you know, there's some, you know, profit motive, and and we shouldn't be accepting that vaccines are effective. And he also demonstrates a misunderstanding of clinical trials, and you know, why we have a um, basically a vaccine with known safety included in a, a clinical trial. 
Um, so anyway, um, again, it, it was a demonstration in confirmation bias. Uh, this guy didn't come into this with an open mind. He didn't come into it with the idea that, hey, maybe I'm wrong about vaccines. Um, he said nothing um, in any of his correspondence about why things like measles suddenly precipitously declined as soon as we had a vaccine on the market. You know, nothing like that. Or about the fact that Japan in 1974 had a very effective um, pertussis vaccine program. About 80% of their kids uh, were vaccinated for it. Um, in the interim uh, between uh, 74 and 79, the vaccination rate declined to about 10%, and they had a pertussis outbreak. They had uh, something like over 300, almost 400 cases of pertussis in 1979 and 41 deaths compared to 1974 when there was an 80% vaccination rate. Um, there were only a handful of cases and um, no deaths. And I'm sorry, there were like 300 something case, cases in 74, no deaths. Um, and I think I said 300 and something cases in 79, but it was actually 13,000 cases and 41 deaths because the vaccine rate declined. So they reinstituted an aggressive vaccine campaign and the pertussis rate declined again in Japan. We see this repeatedly in the US with under-vaccinated populations. You know, they become sort of the epicenter of a disease outbreak. Right, there, I feel like I've heard a few stories about uh, outbreaks here and there. Yeah, measles uh, in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, Texas has a pertussis outbreak almost every year just because of unvaccinated and undervaccinated people, uh, because Texas has particularly lax vaccination rules. Mm. Um, states where you don't have lax vaccination rules, uh, places like Mississippi and West Virginia, that um, for over a decade now have outlawed anything except medical exemptions, you don't see it, um, outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases there because kids oh. are required to get them. It kind of reminds me of something else Texas is bad at, which is sex education, leading yeah. to Texas having one of the higher teen pregnancy rates in the country. Yes. I mean, you know, same kind of thing of uh, people denying the benefit of basically a necessary public good and then right. being all surprised when the consequences yeah. come home to roost. Yeah. And not only that, but um, Texas also has the, I think, the highest rate of repeat teen pregnancies. So mm -hmm. it's not just, and, and that is not even um, strictly a sex education thing. That is also about a lack of access to family planning clinics and services. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so uh, yeah, that kind of wraps up my little conversation about confirmation bias. But basically, if you start with the answer and you work backward to find justifications and you discount anything that might disconfirm your um, preconceived notion of what the reality is, um, then of course you're going to discover that you're not wrong. Right. Yeah, a lot of people like to call themselves skeptics uh, and don't realize that not believing something at face value is only one step on the road to being skeptical. Right. You, you then have to do the hard work of actually finding things out and looking into what the evidence is. and looking into what the scientific consensus is and why and understanding the background material is actually another step. It's not just saying, oh, I'm doubtful, therefore I'm a skeptic. Yeah. Yes. All right, so uh, we have calls. And uh, again, I am happy to be working with this fancy new phone system, which I hope I don't ruin. But assuming I didn't, uh, Michelle should be on the air. Michelle is from uh, Rochester Hills, um, Michigan. Is that Michigan. it? That yeah. would be me. Okay. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Struggling a little bit with the pro-life site, but other than that, I'm doing good. Okay. What's I on have your a mind? question uh, about Christian therapy. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm. I'm struggling to understand how it's legal and how it's moral, as opposed to secular therapy. Uh, can you tell us what you mean by sec by Christian therapy? I mean, um... 
Um, like, I, like I, I would experience. imagine that if it's voluntary, then somebody giving you therapy because you asked them to and coming at you with a Christian slant, uh, I wouldn't agree with it, but it, I wouldn't make it illegal. So uh, tell me What if you more. didn't ask? Then like for in, in <laughs> you'd my have case, a consent I problem. Went, uh, in my case, I started going to a group in, in Rochester Hills for uh -huh. sexually abused women. Mm. Uh, the group started with a man, and I was okay with that. He wasn't pushing God. He wasn't pushing religion. It was just we talked about issues. Uh, the second semester of that group started with a woman named Doreen Lilly, a Christian therapist. Okay. I did not know what, I did not know at the time she was a Christian therapist. Okay. So, uh, so what did what were you led to understand about her credentials? I really was just told that she had a master's level in ther in in psychology. Okay. Okay. Um, I was told that she was just leading the group, and I continued with the group. Uh, after I met my current husband. She encouraged us to come to her for friends practicing therapy. That is exactly how she put it. She needed to practice. Okay. And I was, because I, I had issues, which I'm not saying I didn't, I needed help. Um, and I came into that therapy believing in God. Hmm. However, I did not believe that Jesus was God. I did not believe in the Holy Trinity and things like that. Okay. Okay. Um, it wasn't long before she invited us to come to her church and started coming to church with me and my husband. So okay. it's, uh, it started, sounds like we uh, your therapist used her uh, sort of position of authority to pressure you to, uh, to get involved in her religious activities, right? Not only that, but she encouraged my following the Bible and disciplining my children uh, in dealing with my husband. I ended up losing my children as a result of therapy wow. with her. How? Um, and since then, I've placed four children for adoption into Christian homes. Mm. Um, my, my, my point of contention is she waited until... I had lost my rights to my children and placed three children for adoption before she told me the Bible was not to be taken taken literally. Well, okay, so l let me let's back up a little bit. How long did you have a therapeutic relationship with this woman? And how long Seven ago? Or eight years. Okay, so th this is a long-standing thing. Okay, all right. Um, and why? She calls herself my mommy. Okay. Um, That's weird. She, yeah. fully encouraged me to transfer everything to her. She encouraged me to mimic her. Okay. Um, that, that sounds beyond garden variety Christianity. That's kind of veering into yeah, cult that's, territory. Yeah, that's cultish. Um, so, I turned her in and nothing was done. Okay. I filed reports to the state of Michigan. I followed all the legal recourses. Okay. They've done nothing. So what was the basis of them taking your children from you? Um, I had spanking them for one, which is biblical. Okay. Uh, oh, I that's... was being told that the TV was, was demonic and was brainwashing my children, so I took a bat to the TV. I got rid of all the televisions Ooh. in the house. <clears throat> I mean, I was doing everything I could to follow the Bible. Okay. And nobody told me it's not really the Word of God. Everybody was encouraging me in my hearing God. Doreen told me she knew I was hearing God's voice. She fully encouraged my behavior until I stopped being crazy. And then she started telling people I was crazy and that I was possessed by demons. Okay, so... She also, uh, she also told me my medication was hiding demons, so I went off of it. Okay. Uh, my antidepressants. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how it, it's moral or legal. I mean, I lost my kids based on listening to her. 
I don't understand it. I'm really struggling with the moral thing now that I'm an atheist to figure this out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, trying to figure out more. This, when this you're is an a tough one because a Christian. yeah, this is kind of a tough one because I mean, I I think that it's terrible that your uh, uh, counselor influenced you that way. I hope you recognize now that uh, that the way you were behaving then might reasonably seen be, have been seen as a threat to the kid, you know, a danger yeah. to the kids. I, I mean, Absolutely. I, I hope, I, I mean, I, I hope you've gotten better and I hope that you're continuing to see a therapist, a, a, a different no. qualified therapist. Yeah. I will never go to therapy again, ever. I well, wish we could change your mind about that, and yeah. I understand that given your past experiences, uh, that 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 this could be a problem. But uh, it it sounds like you have some issues to work out and deal with that maybe a qualified, licensed, and competent therapist, which it sounds like this person definitely was not, uh, could help address. You know what I'm saying? I, d I am not so sure that we even have secular therapy in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Well, I don't that's... know how well you guys know Michigan, no, but we are I mean, hugely yeah. Republican and hugely religious. Yeah, I understand how yeah. that is. Well, I mean, um, I think you can find um, secular therapists there. Um, and, you know, there's a this uh, secular therapy project anyway. And you can actually I reach. Them. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, maybe they can refer you to someone who could help you. Um, I don't know that I need help. I mean, well, I, I mean, it, what it, I'm it, looking for help with is just to stop this insanity. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you tell people right off the bat it's not literal, it helps a lot with the mental stuff. Right. Well, but the thing I, is. I was yeah, some people believe it is literal. Um, I have a real problem with religious-based therapy anyway, mm -hmm. um, because um, I, I don't think that it's a therapist's job to kind of feed into, or you know, feed into someone's religious beliefs. Um, I think that's uh, completely inappropriate, and they should be focusing on. Um, the actual secular um, issues that, that clients bring in. Um, if they did that, they wouldn't make any money. She makes money keeping people sick for years. Well, That's yeah. That's how well, it works. Well, yeah, but most therapists every don't do that. Every therapist makes some kind of money, but yeah. every doctor makes some kind of money. And we were just talking at the top of the show about the fact that they're in business because there's a need for, uh, for medical health. Uh, and there's a need for mental health treatment too and we don't i mean you know i certainly don't think that it should be uh something that comes with a terrible stigma right um and i you know I, obviously i'm not diagnosing you over the phone but uh if if i knew you in the days when you were uh you know not just spanking your children which it which is uh, kind of a bad idea, but minor, but also like smashing up the TV in front of them. I'd yeah. be scared for uh, for their safety. Yes. Uh, she was proud of me. Yes, and that's that's yes. awful. So, it's, it's awful that this other person was encouraging you to uh, dive deeper into dangerous behavior. I agree with that. Yeah. I guess my point is, if if I guess for me, I didn't know that they're allowed to lie. I really did not know that. Like, I didn't know that they could lie on the Internet. And I feel like a jackass. Mm. But at the same time, I'm wondering how that's worse than what they're doing. Um, what's worse than what? Th yeah, what's worse than... Like, what's worse? My behavior or their encouraging of it? Because it could have stopped if somebody had just told me early on, you can't take the Bible literally. It's not, you know, well, it's not the Word of God. They're both problems. Yeah, I mean... Okay. I, I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned about 
Um, oh, your mic was off. <laughs> My mic was My off. My sitting here, and I'm actually much healthier now. Yeah, yeah. well, that's good. I mean, well, I'm, I'm glad. sitting right I, here. I, I, Sorry about the mic being off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, I guess I'm a little concerned that you um, were doing these things that, I mean, if I saw someone doing this in front of children, I would, like Russell said, perceive that to be, you know, a threatening thing for the kids. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that you went back to, because the Bible said it and you took it literally, that you thought that was okay. I did. That's how I was raised. I mean, I was, we were raised being beat. It's not, it's not like, so the therapist, and they strongly encourage physical discipline with your kids. When the police show up after you've disciplined your kids, they tell your kids we're allowed to hit them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you're a product of your environment to an extent. Well, I, I agree with that, but you, you can also get past that. I mean, I was, if um, somebody finally tells you that it's wrong, yes. But if they're not well, telling you that it's wrong, if we come from monkeys, how are we supposed to know that? There are a lot of different ways to pick up social cues about yeah. what's acceptable behavior. And, uh, you know, I think it is definitely sad and unfair that, uh, that both your state of mind and the people that you were surrounding yourself with uh, were sending you bad messages about things that you know, in an objective sense, are uh, uh, threatening and, and potentially harmful to your kids. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm it not sure what else to say. Woke, it, my children I, woke up my morals on that. Yeah. When my children told me that they hated me for that, mm -hmm. I really stopped and went, whoa, wait a minute. I really had to re-examine my whole entire thought system, my whole belief system, Everything about me, I've had to pick apart, and I'm trying to, to get it. Even the homosexuality issue. Yeah. Everything about me is having to be redone. And that's kind of where I'm coming from with the okay. moral thing. All right. Well, I'm trying I... to understand it. I agree with you. I mean, all, I think we're going to sound like a broken record here, so we're going to probably move on to the next call. But, I mean, d bottom line, I agree with you that your therapist was incredibly unethical. Uh, I'm sorry for what you went through. Um, I don't blame you for having a lot of pain and guilt about, uh, about your past actions, and I think maybe you should c uh, consider talking to uh, another person who could be helpful to you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to say thanks for calling, Michelle. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. So next we have uh, Drew from New Mexico, uh, right near where I grew up. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right, Russell. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, I was a I was a high school student. Well, I lived in Santa Fe and commuted to Los Alamos. And I know I went to Las Cruces a few times for uh, high school debate tournaments. How are things do over there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> besides the meth problem, <laughs> I, it's uh, okay. Uh, I, I work as a uh, I work as a prosecutor, so I see kind oh, of man. the. Uh, the dredges and the bad stuff. Are you a Breaking Bad fan by any chance? <laughs> uh, despite my friend's encouragement, I have not seen the show yet, but okay. I've seen many a Walter White here. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. Uh, well, sorry to hear it. What's on your mind? Well, uh, Russell, I just wanted to um, debate a pretty classic theistic argument. Um, so I'll phrase it more of as a question. I, I've read the counters to the classic fine-tuning argument, you know, a branch mm -hmm. of the teleological argument. I don't really find many of the responses um, satisfying uh, okay. to obviate an inference of de design. So why I was don't just you, curious. Why what don't you tell you, the audience first what uh, your take on the fine-tuning argument is? Like, give a basic presentation of it. 
I appreciate that. I was going to ask to be able to sketch it out. Sure. So uh, the way I formulate it is we have the initial conditions of the universe. We have uh, physical laws governing our universe, and we have constants built into certain properties of the universe and certain uh, equations of the physical laws. Um, and the pretty much broad consensus, there are dissenters, but the broad consensus is uh, even the slightest variation to some of these constants built into the universe, and you have a universe that can't support life. I don't actually um, in, think the consensus in, is all that broad about uh, about how slight those changes can be. Okay, well, just just throwing that out. Happen. I mean, I'm not but, trying to stop you from making the argument. I just want to make sure that if I disagree with any of your points, I'm going to make sure it's registered. Go on. No problem. But, um, but quite frankly, I'll go with Stephen Hawking talking about the fragility of these constants uh, over you. Uh, and okay. I don't say that rudely or anything. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, the point being the tenuousness of these constants, it's so extraordinary, at least from where I'm coming from, from what I'm reading, that the implication is the design inference is more justified than just random chance that all these constants, and there's an extraordinary number of them, um, all these physical laws, the way they are, it's extraordinary. So hence the design inference. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much detail Stephen Hawking goes into on this. I mean, I, I am aware that, uh, that if some constants were slightly different, uh, there, there would not be life as we know it. Uh, but in yeah. order to say that there could be no life of any kind, you would have to uh, come up with a counterexample because we're not familiar with universes with vastly different laws of physics, and in fact, we're not even sure. We're not even aware of whether those uh, whether those variations are possible theoretically. I mean. Once you get beyond the observed laws of the universe, speculating on what it would be like if things were way, way different is hard to do because you can't actually experiment on them. Yeah. You have anything to add, Jen? Well, no, just the, right. uh, interesting that you brought up That's, Stephen Hawking, who is unconvinced by this fine-tuning argument that you're presenting. Right. I mean, you say you agree with Stephen Hawking, but Hawking doesn't think there's a god, so what's up with that? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. It, it, fair point. I agree with Stephen Hawking when he says the universe is fine-tuned. He doesn't take... Uh, can you give me a, a specific that's, that's quote a trivial, instead of vaguely... Like, you know, that's almost a trivial uh, comment. Absolutely. The emergence and, right. of complex structures capable of supporting intelligent observers seems to be very fragile. The laws of nature form a system that is extremely fine-tuned. He said fine seems to be. Very little in physical law can be altered without destroying the possibility of the development of life as we know it. I could give you as, a quote Okay, Reisler, and again, Susskind. as we know it. I mean, yeah. he, he's talking about, in hindsight, we're seeing the precise parameters that allow, uh, that allows life like us to live, which reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Douglas Adams, where he said, we're kind of like a puddle of water, uh, saying, well, this is an interesting hole I find myself in. It's perfectly shaped to have me in it, so it must have been designed around me. When, in fact, the opposite is true. Water just lands in the shape of the, of the way the hole actually is. Yeah. You see what I mean? Right. And, uh, yeah, and that's one of the objections I've read. Right. I, I think that fails to address how specific... Uh, what we can know about the universe based on theoretical physics. Actually, it's, what you're it's saying is directly on point. What, no, no, I mean, because it's a very reasonable assumption to believe that life can't emerge if the universe collapsed back on itself. But that's or not what Stephen Hawking that's, yeah, said not what in he's the saying. quote you read. Yeah, no, I it, mean, you left out the part where he said, as we know it. Well, and not only that, but here's a, here's a further clarification of Hawking's views on this. The, that intelligent beings in these regions should therefore not be surprised if they observe that their locality in the universe satisfies the conditions that are necessary for their existence. It is a bit like a rich person living in a wealthy neighborhood not seeing any poverty. So basically you're seeing you know, what's right there in front of you. It seems obvious, 
but you know it's because your your view is necessarily limited well hawking uh, right I, I didn't say hawking accepts a de design inference i'm saying he acknowledges the observable universe is fine tuned that's a separate he, did he, he from did, the he, argument he said it appears to be fine yeah he says it appears to be fine tuned he didn't make any absolute statement on that. He said it appears to be fine-tuned. Right. The science we have, uh, correct. Right. The, the evidence we have, uh, what we know about the universe, it appears like life is dependent on, you know, the balanced razor's edge of these constants, as it were. So, yeah, I, I mean, you're going to go into science fiction if you're going to tell me, though, the universe that well, collapsed upon you're itself, already the in science fiction yeah. you're already going into science fiction when you hypothesize what other universes could have been like and then say that you know about that i mean if we're going to talk about that's who's dealing with science physics. fiction <clears throat> that's theoretical physics talk to martin reese talk to leonard suskin talk to so, alan guth lee smolin these people will tell you if the cosmological constant is altered by conservative estimate one part in 10 to the 54, they will tell you what we know about physics says life can't emerge from that. So, they so, won't say so right, let me, so. let me. The only on. quote you've read from us is the Stephen Hawking quote, which didn't actually say that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not, okay. given Would that like one quote, continue? I'm not willing to take so, your word that the rest of them agree with you. So, is it your claim that this universe was fine tuned for humans? No, I, I'm not going to say specifically, uh, I'm not going to infer why the universe is as it is. Um, I will just say that the universe supporting life at all um, does support a design inference over random chance. So, but so like it's fine-tuned to support life? If you'd like, because you no, wait, no, I don't, I, I don't care about the other physicists. I want to ask you about your argument here. Are you saying that this universe is fine-tuned sure. to support life? I'm saying the universe requires uh, extraordinary fine tuning for life to be able to emerge from it. That is an almost trivial dodge of the question I just asked you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misunderstood then, please. Are you saying that this universe is fine? Please rephrase because I misunderstood. Is the universe fine tuned to support life? Yes. Okay, then yes. why is it that in most of the universe, any life out there would die instantly. It is almost universally hostile to life throughout the universe that we know about. Why is that? If we're fine-tuned to support life. Right. And this sort of misses the point of the argument, right? If I take um, all the ways you can order metal and plastic and show you all the varieties that can be ordered and present you with a car, and say, look, this is probably designed. This isn't a random ordering. It's not really a response to say, well, planes can go faster. Planes are better. Your car has, well, that's, you know, that's here's, irrelevant the, wheels. To the, here's the problem with that. And we're veering oh, less into the fine tuning and more into the argument from design. But the actual problem with that is basically um, <clears throat> that there is, <laughs> there is, so, the way that we determine whether something is designed or not is not just by saying, look how complex it is. The way we determine whether it's designed or not is by observing its similarity to specific things that we have evidence for being designed by something with a mind, which means that the argument from design is backwards because it takes things that weren't necessary that weren't no noticeably designed, like rocks and trees and oceans and things like that, and then inventing a bigger, cooler mind that we have no evidence of and saying, oh, it's got to be like human design. Right. Like, it, it, it's just analogy, not true just... that... It's just not true that we decide things are designed by looking at complexity because there are lots of things that are extremely complex that we have no idea if they were designed or not. Russell, if I can answer that, I uh -huh. agree with you. I, my analogy was only responding to Jen's point there of how can you say this universe was fine-tuned for life? Look how much more plentiful 
black holes are, etc. To me, I didn't right. say that's that. Not really an answer. That, that's it's actually not life, what I said. That life can emerge at all is extraordinary and requires an extraordinary amount of fine tuning, and that does lead to a, a design inference fairly. I, I don't think. think you've Just established that. that no, life you're... isn't the most abundant part of the universe. To me, that's kind of a silly mm -hmm. response. I don't think you've established that. So life that. has to be the most abundant presence in the universe to infer Well, design. you're not saying that the universe no. was fine-tuned for life. You're dis it was fine-tuned uh, for life to exist in like point oh 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 one percent of it is what you're saying. Sure. I don't see how that puts a dent in the point of the argument whatsoever. Well, I mean, I don't think you really made the, way, the case the either. Way, but. Yeah. Well, by the way, I don't, uh, I'm not saying there's not life <laughs> elsewhere in the universe. This, the size of the universe could be uh, also, you know, serve other purposes. Yeah, but I, most of one, it is I empty mean, space, and we're, <laughs> and we're yeah. pretty sure that life doesn't exist on most of the nearby regions. Right, and the enormity of the universe is awe-inspiring. It's amazing. When P.Z. Right. Myers critiques the, this fine-tuning argument by saying, well, why not a universe of perpetual beachfront acreage? I, I think that's <laughs> stupid, really. I think the way the universe is, it's, it's very amazing. It's just supposed to be stupid. It's, an, it's a reductio ad absurdum. Yeah. It's one that fails to convince me. Okay, well, well the well, argument for fine-tuning fails to convince me, yeah. and Stephen Hawking, apparently. So I guess so, we're uh, just uh, at an impasse then. Yeah, and just about every other cosmologist okay, so out there. The, the response, then the response that I'm hearing is, okay, there's more empty space in the universe, and life only inhabits point zero zero, however many amount of zeros, occupies that much space, therefore... Um, I really don't care that it appears that these constants well, are so... I, I think the point is that given all the possible life places that life could have shown up in this enormous universe, uh, the probability of life in any particular place could be huge. I mean, the probability against life evolving in any particular place, but we wouldn't be there to uh, say, oh, look... Yeah. The, here we are on this planet where life didn't evolve because obviously we're not there. Uh, uh, so life could be incredibly ridiculously improbable to say nothing of going back to science fiction, all the other hypothetical, theoretical, parallel universes where there is no life at all and this just happens to be the one universe where that worked out. Uh, Saying that there's a small right. probability we, of something happening doesn't mean that it could never have happened. Okay. And, and what you reiterated there was the weak anthropic principle, right? That mm -hmm. life can only observe itself in a universe that's propitious for life to be there in the first place. I right. mean, that's, that's tautology. That only, it's only useful if what you later linked it to was a, a hypothetical multiverse. Sure, but, but when you come down to it, so is your way of proving God. I, I mean, every, like, when the only tool you have is God to answer questions, like, I, I think everything requires intelligence to come out of it. So, oh, hey, here's a problem. Oh, I know, intelligence, fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also kind of, uh, kind of tautological the way you're framing it. Okay, but here's my point, though, Ross, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's a fair thing to say. Then, at best, if I grant where you're coming from, which I don't, because I have a couple response, more responses to that. Okay. But then, at best, you're left with two imaginary scenarios, because there's no empirical evidence of a multiverse. What you're whatsoever. left with, and what, what you're left with, is neither of us has any idea, and you can't that. just jump to a conclusion and say yeah. that's definitely the answer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the, the argument is actually quite modest. I'm not saying fine-tuning of the universe, therefore 100% certainty God. I'm saying... It sounded it like you were saying that. Design inference. Um, uh, no, I've said it supports a design inference. And what's interesting to me about the hypothesis of the multiverse is that's actually an ad hoc uh, thing that physicists came up with to explain the fine-tuning. 
they're like, while this is interesting, perhaps there's a multiplicity of other universes where these constants are varied, and eventually we hit these very precise ones and couple that with the anthropic principle. But here physici- but, but here's, here's the difference. Here's, here's the difference. Here's the difference. Physicists don't actually say, oh, this is the only possible thing we've thought of that could yeah. address the problem, therefore the multiverse has to exist. They're tossing out possibilities, basically the same as you apparently are, since you're not saying it has to be God, you're just yeah. saying, oh, here's one possible explanation, cosmic intelligence. Well, here's another possible explanation, uh, parallel universes. Yeah. What does one answer or the other have as an advantage over the other? Nothing, really, since we haven't brilliant, observed any brilliant sort of... question. Yeah. No, no, no. No, brilliant okay. question, Russell, Why, thank you. I was just about to say why the God hypothesis should have an edge over the multiverse hypothesis. Okay, hit me. Number one, and I've got multiple, so if you want to take them one at a time, fine, but at least okay. let me finish each one. Number one, the multiverse was ad hoc to address a specific fine-tuning problem. Teleology, mm -hmm. teleology and the God hypothesis has been around for a while. Fine-tuning was only... So it was made up so longer hard, ago right? when we knew less, and that yeah. somehow makes it a better answer? When somebody has an independent motivation for a hypothesis and not just the data that has emerged, you know, after the fact, that is, that does uh, help me out. For instance, if you rolled a die 20 times, came up with a bizarre sequence of uh Die and you said, oh, well, this is no surprise. Um, there's an invisible man in the room who has the ability to will this dice to come up that way. That's yeah, but, silly. But, if but coming up with that. Told, but if beforehand you told me, mm -hmm. uh, well, wait this sequence, I'm going to roll a die and it's going to have this 20 sequence, that would be extraordinary to me because you've got six to the power of 20 improbability of what just happened. Right, but coming up with an explanation so, to, to, to coming up with an explanation to explain an observed result is basically how science works. And if I got 20, yeah. 20 times in a if I got six 20 times in a row or whatever you said, I wouldn't come up with invisible men necessarily, uh, but I would say, hey, uh, here's a hypothesis. This is not a fair die. But then, you know, like this might be a weighted gambler's die or something like that for somebody who was trying to cheat. But then saying that's a possible explanation, while it's a legitimate step in the process, isn't the end of the process. It, there's actually all that other stuff in the scientific method where you have to say, all right, how can I test the difference between this being a weighted die and this not being a weighted die? How can I test the difference between there being a cosmic mind and there not being one? And the God thing never goes beyond that point. They're just content to say, all right, this explanation has been around for a long time and it works for me, job's done. Right. And, and, and fair enough. Uh, I, I have more responses to the multiverse. I want to mm -hmm. say for myself, and this could be a million rabbit trails, for me there's other independent reasons to prefer God over a multiverse, but I, I didn't call in to discuss cosmological arguments or my own personal experiences or miracles, mm -hmm. um, the moral argument, all that. But to me, those all do feed into where I'm coming from on weighing a multiverse. Um, versus the God hypothesis. But directly to the multiverse, here's another problem. The models we've constructed mathematically, um, particularly the ones that have the most support, like inflationary cosmology, what we're finding is physicists, the, even the ones who have pioneered these, are backing away from them because they found out that, oh, we've just recreated the fine-tuning problem one level up. For instance, inflationary, co inflationary cosmology you know, that's the bubble universe is coming out of the false vacuum. Well, for these bubble universes to have the initial conditions to create our universe requires its own form of fine tuning um, under this multiverse. Uh, Paul Steinhardt, and I might be pronouncing his last okay. name wrong, he was one of the physicists in the 80s who was coming right. up with inflationary cosmology. He's backed off of it now. He says, we set out to do this to solve the problem of fine-tuning in the initial conditions of the universe, 
we've run into fine tuning problem right. all over again. So Drew, um, I I feel like this is taking a common pattern that I hear with a lot of pro god arguments, which is basically uh, trying to focus on. Uh, poking holes in other alternative theories, which uh, everybody agrees already are not well established, and there and it's difficult to find a way to choose between them. But trying to uh, work on the assumption that if you eliminate every possible imagined alternative, then then the only thing you're left with is God, and that's a straight up argument from ignorance because. Uh, the God theory, to the extent that I could even dignify it by calling it a theory, I would just call it an assumption, Yeah, uh, seems to be immune in the mind of believers to this sort of hole poking. And so it gets a special place where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to come up with potential objections to all these other things. Uh, but God just wins by default. And I don't see it that way because I see God as a pretty extraordinary claim that needs direct support, positive support. Um, fair enough, but I guess my point is it just seems odd to us theists when no matter how unparsimonious um, the new hypothesis is to avoid a divine uh, an inference of divine design or something like that. Uh, it's just odd, and it's odd that nobody acknowledges it. I mean, if I were an atheist, which I'm not, mm -hmm. but uh, approaching this objectively, I would have to say, you know, this is compelling. It wouldn't, it wouldn't instantly make me a theist. Of course not. And I'm not advocating, hey, look at this argument. You should be theist 100%. It's just, it's very interesting. You know, scientists, or excuse me, physicists, postulating close to an infinite, and in some cases an infinite number, number of alternative universes just to get away from this problem versus, I mean, what's more par parsimonious? Apply Occam's razor, a singular mind designer or just this multiplicity of billions to up to an infinite Single mind designer isn't, in, isn't yeah. parsimonious yeah, at that's all. Not it's parsimonious a hugely at all. complicated answer, which requires tons of assumptions that people generally don't acknowledge. Yeah. You you have an article generally, there that it looks like you want to no. discuss. I, no? I will concede that I will concede that Occam's razor shaves away God many a time, but when it's mm -hmm. running up against an even more unparsimonious explanation you have to just weigh it and say look god is more simple it's excuse it's, me it's more s simple to i don't buy it god then i don't buy i don't buy for a second don't i don't account. buy for a second that god is simple i'm not saying it's simple i'm saying when it's weighed against the multiverse which is an infinite number an infinite so, ensemble so what why really do you focus universes? on the multiverse yeah i mean that and, yeah and, that and, isn't and, even necessarily the yeah what sorry what jen no i was gonna say if, if it's so simple um why do you think that most cosmologists reject the idea of god as the answer I don't know. I, I, I would assume the philosophical implications of the argument, it, it, that's independent of what you think about the science and the data. So um, your so explanation is scientists are all sinners and they object yeah, to the why idea would they, Why would they pursue something that... That's a nice way to twist my words. <laughs> but, <laughs> sounds like it. That. I just said, for but, whatever reason, they don't want to make the, draw the same philosophical conclusions that I do. Yeah, but, but you're I not the first the theist we've talked to. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why would, they, why would they continue to pursue something that you think is so obviously wrong? Oh, goodness, I want physicists to continue to explore the universe. If there is a deeper law at play here, or there is a multiverse that explains this, then great. Uh, I mean, Well, that's what they're pursuing. The it's just that to keep going. this we idea have that... a gap of knowledge right now. All I'm saying and your God lives is in that gap. gap. Knowledge. Right now, your multiverse lives in that no, gap. No, your God Everything lives in the gap. As soon as the gap closes, your God gets smaller and smaller. It happens with all the other branches of science, too. 
Uh, my faith is not dependent on this argument. I just find it a very okay. intriguing argument. Well, then why are we, we having this conversation? It, yeah, you find it an intriguing argument having already been a theist and looking for reasons yes. to support your theism. Do you, I mean, you, this isn't the argument that convinced you, right? I mean, that other stuff about personal experience and miracles and things like that, I'm willing to bet are the things that made you a believer. This is and just then after that, you the came confirmation up with the, bias. The science. That, this is the confirmation bias you know, part. Um, I, 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 can I respond to that, please? Sure. Uh, but a, uh, after this really response, big. we're going to have to move on because this has been a big chunk of the show. Uh, that's fair enough. Go ahead. I appreciate. First of all, you asked why did. First of all, you asked why did I call, and the, the reason is I do love to engage and hear what atheists say in response um, to these arguments. But number two. It's tremendously unfair for you to make an assumption of how I approached this argument, how I learned about it. The fact is, in college, uh, my faith was very much shaken, and I picked up tons of atheist literature, and I read voraciously uh, to the detriment of my studies. I was reading atheist literature, and having read a good chunk of material on both sides, I'm telling you, I am a theist now. I identify as a theist, but... As objectively as I can, I say this argument favors theism. And the alternative explanations for the fine-tuning argument uh, just don't hold water in comparison. Okay. Well, thanks for your input. Uh, I guess we'd still disagree on it. But uh, interesting call. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it, Russell. Take care. See you later. Uh, let's see, what time is it? Oh, all these lights in my eyes. I can't yeah, read the computer. I think we got three <laughs> minutes. I, I can go longer. No, if I you mean, want to. I usually go an hour and a half if okay. that's okay yeah, that's with cool. you. That's, yeah, that's um, fine. Right. Like, we're not bound by the studio rules anymore. Yeah. Uh, did you want to add something else, or should we just go on to. No, let's, let's keep taking calls right. here. So. Uh, we have uh, Michelle, but not the same Michelle. This one is in New York. Hello. Hi, Russell and Jen. How are you guys doing tonight? Hi. Good. Did I talk to you I last week? To... Yes, I'm sorry. I, I felt okay. terrible. My phone died. Yeah, I felt bad, too, because I was really kind of uh, looking forward to hearing what you had to say after uh, Martin and I had our yeah. monologues. <laughs> you know what? I, I listened to both you guys. Um, I probably listened to it about five times because I really just wanted to... Um, you know, understand where you guys are call coming from. So I did. I did understand what mm -hmm. you guys were saying. And thank you so much for answering my call. So my question last week. So I just have one more. Is, is that all right? That's what I was going to end with, was, was my one more question. Sure. Okay. okay. So here's my question. You kind of touched with it on the last call, but not I'm not that much in the theology. Uh, my brain can't think that far. But what do you guys think of, and Jen, I, I, wouldn't, I would love your opinion, too, if you don't mind, of uh, your miracles as well, and I'm talking about verified miracles, you know, that in a Christian would, would say, like, you know, on It's Supernatural with Sid Roth, like verifiable miracles. Um, what would you guys, you know, how do you guys explain that? If you don't mind me asking. I'm, I'm not aware that there have been any verifiable uh -huh. miracles that could be attributed to, like, supernatural interference. Mm hmm So... I mean, what, which miracles are you talking about? Sure. Would you like for me to give you one, one example that, that pops up in my mind? Okay. Is, is that what you, you, you would like? What, I mean, yeah. what, you're the one saying that there's these miracles that are verified, so what are you talking sure. about? Well, like, okay, I know, before I tell you, I know the answer may be, you know, well, you weren't there, you, you did not see it, but, but this is one that, that I, I truly believe truly happened, is um, I read a book, um, by Corey Ten Boob and her and her sister had Jews and they, you know, went, ultimately went to prison. Um, an example would be when her sister died, they, they were both, they weren't in a concentration camp because they were not Jews, they were in a prison. And when they died, like an example would be her sister, um, you know, was very badly, um, you know, she had frostbite, lice in her hair, you know, just did not, it looked very dehumanized. And um, even people who were not Christian said, you know, um, oh my goodness, because her body went back the moment she died to before she ever entered the prison. So it looked like you and I went on a on a daily basis. That would be an example. But I'm saying, like, like okay, so I like, just give you an example. How would you guys 
explain that. I know you weren't there. I know that you guys have the spaces, and, and, and uh, I understand that. <clears throat> yes. Sorry, I'll, I'll stop. It's... Yeah, I, I don't know that that could be considered a verified miracle. And, and I mean... Mm -hmm. I doubt that happened. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very saying. skeptical that that actually happened. So, so, hmm. okay. I, I, I guess, I guess, I just wanted a little bit more of an explanation from you guys. Did you guys know that Christians say, well, there, there have been miracles, and I guess I was just looking for a little bit more. I, right. I understand. Yes. There are there are a lot of cases where I, I mean, obviously. Uh, an alleged miracle that uh, is in the past and there's no photographic record of it and uh, and there aren't enough people around to uh, give clear uncontradictory accounts are difficult to verify uh, and it's hard mm -hmm. to say anything specific about them but uh, time and time again when you get these miracles to the point where you do have, you are in a position to verify over and over again what you see happen is that uh, reviewing the actual evidence winds up changing the story and even the people who were promoting the miracle story if they get pressed on details start to uh, back off more and more and say okay maybe I didn't remember that particular part right. Yeah. If a miracle like you were talking about ever actually had really solid evidence uh, behind it, uh, then that would be pretty astounding. And even more amazing, if you could come up with the circumstances under which that miracle would happen uh, and be able to repeat that consistently, then you would have more than a, a, an astounding miracle. You would have actual science proving that this thing actually is able to happen under particular conditions. But just saying, I heard from someone who heard from someone who heard from someone oh. that somebody's body was reconstituted, Yeah, it's hard to take seriously. No, I, I understand, but like, I guess what I'm saying is like, it's, and, and I'll end on this because you guys answered my question, but I, I will end on this. But I just gave you one example, but just what I'm thinking in my head as well, and I'm sorry, I probably did not give the best example, so, so my true apologies. Um, is like, you know, it's Supernatural with Sid Roth. I don't know if you all have heard of that show, but they have people on each week that, you know, all the information on their end has been truly verified. Have you heard of that show? Which show is it? Say? It's called It's Supernatural with Sid Roth. Isn't that a fictional show? Wait. <laughs> yeah, there's this. No, I haven't really heard of I mean, I know that there's like a drama mm -hmm. called Supernatural. Yeah. No, well, well, they, well, they have, well, th that, that's why I oh. asked you the question, and I'm done, so I'll let you go, but I just wanted to end on that, is that they do have people week to week on that show that have had, you know, miracles, and, that, and that's why I was wondering on, on your end what you guys truly, you know, I you think know, that, thought. I think for, um, first of all, I would be very mm -hmm. skeptical of anything um, like that on a TV show that's <laughs> claiming that these things right. have been verified. Um, you know, James Randi at the James Randi Foundation has offered a $1 million mm -hmm. paranormal challenge for people for years if they can oh. demonstrate the existence of a supernatural event mm -hmm. under controlled conditions. They can get a, a million dollars. That prize has remained unclaimed for what's it been, over 20 uh, years now, something like that? Well, yeah, I'm not sure exactly, I mean, but it's been a long time. You know, it's, there's a million dollars waiting mm -hmm. for somebody that can, can verify a miracle. And it's no one's claimed it. And people claim all different kinds of miracles, but uh, what the Randy Foundation basically does is have them nail down exactly what can you do under what circumstances, yeah. and do you agree that this would be a fair test if we did things this way? And once they've agreed to that, uh, I mean, either they back out at that stage because they're like, okay, I'm not gonna get get past these guys. Or mm -hmm. they go in kind of overconfident and take the test, and then nothing happens, and then you get a bunch of excuses out of it. Like, it never seems to happen that people make this very concrete, specific claim about a miracle that mm -hmm. will occur, and then they're able to pull it off. It, it, See, just, guess, it just kind of yeah, evaporates guess, when you scrutinize it. Yeah, yeah I guess... Um, uh, the, 
you know, you guys have answered my question. Thank you so much. But I guess I'll end on this. I guess because I'm looking at it from, and I'm not saying, you know, um, in a negative way, but since I'm looking at it from a Christian perspective, I guess I hear a lot more than maybe, and I'm not saying you guys haven't listened or heard anything Christian, but maybe I've heard more because I'm on the Christian side. You know what I mean? Well, I'm a former Uh Christian, so I know what the mindset is. It, I like, am not, oh, you, you, but I read a lot of stuff. No, no I'm, I'm sorry, Jen. What did you say? My I, I'm a, I'm a former say? Christian, so I get it. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you guys both so much for taking my call. Right. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye. Nice to talk to you again, Michelle. Um, Let's see. What do we got here? What have we got? I lost my. I was looking up Supernatural, which was indeed a TV show, and yeah. that's really distracting. <laughs> uh, who's on line four? Um, Sean. Sean. Oh, almost hit the wrong button. Sean in. It looks like Utah. Utah, yeah. Hi, Sean. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Great. Um. I have a pretty straightforward question. I don't know if it's been answered before on your guys' show. Okay. So, uh, do you guys look forward to a day when religion is gone? And do you think it ever will be gone? And do you think that would be a good thing? Well, that question has been asked on the show before. And okay. the answer is, I don't know that we can ever, um, there will ever be a time when religion in all its many forms is completely gone. Um, what I would like to see is that religion is relegated to the small dark corner where it belongs. Okay. So, what are your views? I'm a, and I don't know, person. <laughs> okay. Um, so I you're... just like to get the opinions of others, you know. Okay. So that addresses what you know. What do you believe? Um... Well, I'm not LDS. I know a lot of people assume that from <laughs> Utah, but, uh, you know, I know a lot of them. And uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I go back and forth between what I believe. And, you know, sometimes it feels nice to believe in something like, you know, afterlife and all that stuff. And, and sometimes it just is like, I don't know, it's not logical. And so I don't know. I don't know where I stand on it. Well, to, to believe something means that you're convinced that it's true or likely true. So my question to you would be, are you convinced that a God exists or is likely to exist? A God, likely, maybe. But again, I don't know. Okay. Uh, there's so many religions, there's so many ideas of so, gods. So you're not convinced that a God does exist? Not convinced, no. Okay. You're an atheist. Could it happen? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, unless you can answer yes to that question, that you are convinced that a God exists, then you're an atheist. Now, okay. you, don't have to call, you don't have to call yourself that, but that's, that's the definition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to throw out my answer to your first question of whether we look forward to religion not existing, I agree with Jen that I don't uh, think it will be eradicated, and I certainly wouldn't want uh, anyone to eradicate it, eradicate it, let's say, by force or coercion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be great if people moved beyond the need for it, uh, and on balance, uh, if you, when people ask me if religion is generally a greater force for good than bad, I don't think so. Uh, I think it accomplishes some things once in a while that are worthwhile, but I don't think that it is that good. Yeah. I think there are purely secular ways of doing for us what religion currently does. And a lot of the, the good that religion does or claims to do is because of the privileged place it occupies um, in society. And I think if we remove some of that privilege, which comes with certain financial advantages as well, um, I think that basically um, people could begin to see it for what it is, which is it's not a net positive for us. Yeah, right. okay. What do you guys think right. has helped uh, the growth of atheism? 
the internet. <laughs> yeah. I would absolutely uh, agree with you. I have <laughs> actually gone around giving a talk called Playing to Win at some conventions where I, where I ta show how the uh, rise of atheism has very strongly correlated with the internet becoming a household word. Uh, and I think it's because religion relies on being enclosed in this protective bubble where everybody says and thinks the same thing all the time. And uh, skepticism and atheism is helped in a lot of ways by uh, other people intruding on those assumptions. Right. Yeah, I was going to say that <coughs> the idea of people being out, because I know that that's one of the things that helped, uh, for example, the um, LGBT rights movement, you know, people being open about it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's much more difficult to um, disparage or discriminate against someone when, when you know them personally rather than they're just this other entity that you don't know personally. Um, and the internet certainly has made that a lot easier. While at the same time acknowledging that it's also made a lot of harassment and unpleasantness yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. easier too. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. You take the good with the bad sometimes. Yeah. On balance, I think the internet is a better thing than religion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Anyway. All right, great. All right, <laughs> thanks for calling. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Uh, I feel like uh, Oliver has been waiting a really, really long time, and he's calling in from Manchester, England. So how are you today? Hello. I'm very good, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, brilliant. And I, I rang up a few weeks ago and it, I was like talking to my girlfriend and you guys couldn't hear me. I mean, you guys could hear me, but I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. So I finally got through to you guys. Um, just uh, just quick before I uh, get on to my subjects, can I just give my little bit of two cents on um, vaccines you were talking about before? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm an ex, I don't know, just, just quickly, I'm an ex-soldier and um, uh, before I deployed to Afghanistan, Mm -hmm. uh, I was injected with about six or seven different vaccines and uh, when we got out there the disease and the poverty and the people were living in uh, I tell you what the, the fathers of their families would give their life to be vaccinated have their mm. children and their yes you know their, their wives vaccinated and you get these people in England and people in America they're saying oh don't get vaccinated because yeah. it's poisonous and it's going to cause autism <laughs> and it's just ridiculous it all comes from that. Um, the doc, Dr. Wakefield, who uh, he was actually struck off the record. He was paid by pharmacists yeah. Yeah. to say that the uh, the injection, yeah, and all that. It's just, it's ridiculous. And the, these people that anti-vaxxers are just causing suffering and yes. death and spreading this to other stupid people who take it and believe it. And it, I, I just, that's, I just want to throw that in there. Yeah. I, I, I hate anti-vaxxers. I think it's ridiculous. Yeah, same here. And, and um, you know, I was in the in the army. So I understand I got, I lined up and got, you know, multiple vaccines at one time, you know, I had a sore arm and in the case of um, having to get the gamma globulin shots, I had a sore butt uh, at one point. But other than that, you know, I didn't get the diseases. <laughs> That's all good. You know? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm still alive and I've not got autism. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, what, what I just want to talk about, I know that gentleman took a lot of time so I'll be as quick as I can um, I was indoctrinated into Christianity when I was about 12 years old um, they were born again Christians proper hallelujah you'd yeah. be sat having dinner and one of them just scream praise the Lord that you know that sort of Christian yeah and uh, they showed me a video of a gentleman who was stung by box jellyfish and uh, he died uh, went to hell um, and then went to heaven and then God said go back to life and convert people and then he came back and I watched this as a young child and I it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't believe what I was watching you and know I just, oh, when, when I was a kid Jesus. when I was a kid and uh, uh, you know I was raised an atheist and my dad played me a record of this radio play which was basically Joseph McCarthy who who did the communist witch hunts in this country dying in a plane crash and there's this whole skit of him going to heaven and then taking over and going to hell and taking over and then they're like, ah, oh, get rid of this guy. We can't stand him. And he goes back to Earth yeah. and, and talks about, you know, how they sent him back. <laughs> um, but, know, sorry, it's, it's that's just, a digression. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know what you say. It's a similar sort of story. But um, 
after after they basically indoctrinated me through this fear tactic, um, they took me to like this preacher, and he did the whole, uh, you know, he, uh, I'm going to make your leg grow. Uh, this is Jesus making your leg grow, and he did it to my oh. mate's dad. He said, uh, yeah, he's like, uh, oh, let me let me heal you. Do you know you got one leg longer than the other? Hello, you praise the Lord. Talked in tongues and all that crap, and then yeah. he slipped his shoe in the middle of his leg grow. And then this old lady in the audience said, can you please heal me? So she wobbled up with a little walking stick. Said, what have you got? So I've got crippling arthritis in my back. My C-spine's knackered. Help me. So he shouts at her a bit, talks in tongues. He goes, how do you feel? And I said, well, I'm still in pain and I can't walk back to my seat. <laughs> and I'm like, so God's more concerned about making someone's leg grow, who didn't even know he had one leg longer than the other, than this poor woman that's crippled with arthritis. And that's where it started for me. And I started thinking, well, I'll, I'll try reading yeah. the Bible. That was ridiculous. Um, so I just gave up on religion then. And then I, since then, I've been a bit of a militant atheist. And over <laughs> here, it, if you're a Christian, you just keep yourself to yourself. If you're an atheist, you keep yourself to yourself. No one really battles. But um, I know in America, it's just widespread Christianity. And I just, I love your show where you just dismantle. And, it, you know, just make these people look so stupid <laughs> when they come up with the, the crap that they come out with i just think it's brilliant um thanks but it, it's, i just think indoctrination and yeah fear and uh, these lies and then the, the money these people make from doing fake miracles i can't believe people believe it yeah well as you can see from uh, our previous caller people do believe it all the time. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, you know, we're not necessarily out to make people look stupid yeah. and feel bad. Yeah, that's, Sometimes that's a side effect. Yeah, but. that's but that's not the point. You know. <laughs> right. It is. It is to like challenge people and get them to think about what they believe. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's it's good when you get those. You know, you get the fierce cause. Like, was it this? The, is it Seamus that keeps ringing in? Um, Oh, uh, I, I can't believe that guy's real. Oh, Hamish. Hamish, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's been a repeat caller. Some people accused him of being a fake. Uh, I think he actually might be the real thing because somebody found a YouTube channel of uh, him appearing to be a sincerely preachy guy. It sounds exactly like him. So we might talk to him again in the future, just not this week. <laughs> okay, um, I just, I'll just I'll leave you guys just one last thing. Um, what what really set me uh, on this path like that I'm really angry with religion and stuff like that, which I shouldn't be, but I am, was a, a story of a, a lady, I think it was Richard Dawkins, Dr. Richard Dawkins, that uh, told the story. Um, she uh, she went and paid thousands and thousands of pounds to see this faith healer. And um, she I think she had uh, multiple sclerosis or something, but she was dying. Um, and she went and got prayed for, paid all this money, traveled around, to, uh, you know, to America and all that to get, get healed. Went home and six months later, she's still in crippling agony and dying. Hmm. So you ring up the faith healer and say, um, why, why am I not healed? We paid all this money, what's going on? And the faith healer said, yeah, the reason why you're not healed is because you've got too much sin in you. So that little girl took herself to the to the barn, set herself on fire and killed herself. Oof. Wow. If religion can do that to someone, if religion can do that to someone, then it's just, pure, in my opinion, it's evil and it needs eradicating. Do you know what I mean? In the way you guys are doing it, through just positive atheism and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not saying go out and kill Christians. I mean, yep. you know, I hope try, not. Try and get people to realize. That, yeah, I know. I know. But try and get people to realize that you know, their religion is causing <clears throat> probably more harm than it is good. Yeah, I mean, uh, religion can uh, convince people to do things that uh, everything else would make it obvious that it's a really bad idea. But when you think that you have the infallible weight of the divine creator of the universe behind your actions, uh, you're less likely to think twice or be reasonable about it. Uh, a lot you can't like, argue with people. Yeah. Well, you can. That's why we're here. Yeah. Well, you try to, but you can, you can say, well, the, the Earth's 6,000 years old, but, I mean, let's have a look at the moon that's covered in craters from millions of years ago. Oh, oh no, the devil put that there to, you know, to deceive you. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you can't argue that because that's what they believe. So that's it. That's the ultimate. The devil did it. So. Right. Yep. And yet, uh, but I, I, try not but to I mean, argue anymore. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want people to get so discouraged that they think nobody ever changes their mind because look at you, <laughs> right? Uh, and well, yeah, well, you told them. You, I, 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 I mean, 
even hardcore born again believers who start out believing in faith healing are not bl such blind idiots that they can't ever change your mind their mind i mean you did and there are lots of other people out there who have too yeah well i like mo most of you guys on the show you like ex christians and you know you've studied the bible way more than probably what most christians have do you know what i mean is i i think there's christians out there that have you know only read half of Genesis and they're, they're still going to church every week shouting hallelujah, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> At least study your religion. <laughs> well, yeah, th thanks for having me on the show, guys. It, honestly, right. I've been waiting a long time to get on and I'd love to call back another time, maybe with a different subject. All right. Well, All right. Uh, thanks for calling, Oliver. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye. Uh, you don't have any special requests for the last caller. It looks like we're down to um. nine minutes. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we've got Stephanie as a priority, I guess, from the studio. So uh, stop taking more calls, guys. <laughs> We're going to stop at 6, seriously. Uh, Stephanie in Germany. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yes? Good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I'm a great fan. I've been watching you for the last... I think four months ago, I actually found you. So um, okay, it's been it didn't have anything to do with that German documentary about us, did it? <laughs> no, not at all. No. no. Oh, okay. okay. No, what what no. was that called again? Shoot, I feel terrible uh, for forgetting. Mission the Control. Name. Mission Control, yeah. Texas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh no, I didn't see that. But oh, you should up. check it out. It won some awards, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. No, I just I've uh, been. I think I've been busy with this for the last two years, three years, watching Hitchens and Dawkins, and so basically I've grown up in a Christian family, but very, very low key, you know, Christmas and Easter, that kind of thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I went, I was confirmed, confirmation, you know. Yep. Um, like a Protestant, and I didn't realize how much I was really, I had been fed all this stuff i was always i always knew evolution was clear to me that was the reality mm -hmm. and i was quite uh shocked when i met people that didn't believe in evolution. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, uh, I was uh i was trained as a baby nurse at one point and it was like a internship and with some nuns um Protestant nuns, and they actually kicked me out of class um, <laughs> when we did anatomy in class, and they were giving me all the um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve, and I thought, okay, uh, you're not serious now. What about Darwin? And they kicked me out of class. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, that was my first uh, contact with people like that. So. And I thought all the time I was quite okay with this and I hadn't really been indoctrinated and I was, I believed in God and, you know, but I was kind of trying to find my own way. Yeah. And, and then last year I actually uh, made the step to deregister. You have to deregister in Germany when you get oh, out yeah, of Germany. Heard yeah. Deregister. Okay. So I went there and I, I was so nervous about this. And that really made me realize how, how deep rooted this whole thing is, you know? Mm -hmm. They make you scared of stupid things and if you can't get rid of it and you don't even know that's happening. Right. Well, and that's so, the thing. It, it, you can't work on it until you know that it's there. And a lot of it is very insidious. You don't, you don't even realize that you've been indoctrinated yeah. until something like that happens and you realize, you know, you got to do something like publicly declare that you're an atheist and yeah that took me a while as yeah. well you know that was really hard to say that i am an atheist <laughs> yes. it was a hard thing to do which is crazy yes so um i have a son who's christened i have a daughter who isn't <laughs> yeah so because i was changing over kind of thing and i left it up to her and she feels the same way as i do now it isn't yeah, uh, germany isn't Germany mostly pretty secular, or what's the situation there? Uh, well, the 
thing is, uh, I teach, right? I'm at a vocational college. I've got a lot of older students, and I find there there's a lot of kids who are really, really not into church anymore mm-hmm. and into religion. But um, on the whole, with uh, I think the <laughs> the German. Um, like you would say, the, the, the government, they're still very much entwined with the church. They, the church can do a lot of things. They have their own rules, work-wise, you know. Yeah. Uh, all things that companies can't do, the church still does it. They were still chucking out people for being gay or remarrying. You know, they had to, uh, they just chucked them out their jobs, things like that. But people are trying to change things here. Yeah, we still have there that, that issue. Against, I mean, we there still was a petition against the blasphemy um, paragraph in the law, mm-hmm. but that got kind of flung out. Uh, so they much partnered up the government and the church. They like each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We still have issues with the church having that sort of privileged position where the churches are allowed to to. Uh, to do things that private employers would never be allowed to do. Right. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think that, yeah, you, know, that's a bit crazy. you know, we have a lot of work ahead of us mm-hmm. to uh, minimize the church's <laughs> influence, definitely. I know, and they're still really clingy, uh, and they're making a lot of money out of it. Yeah. So we pay church tax, plus the state of Germany pays a lot of tax as well. Yeah. So they are uh, actually, it's a big big money in this for them and now they're really happy with all the refugees coming over because a lot of them are uh, Christians yeah hmm. yeah well that <laughs> that night I think that you know they see a lot of these refugees coming over and even the ones that are not Christians a lot of the churches see potential converts there when they see these desperately poor you know hungry people coming across you know this is this yeah. is perfect for them Exactly, they jump on it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And it's you know, it's like as much as I support the idea of any organization stepping in to take care of refugees like that, and and a lot of churches do that. Um, you know, the downside to that is that there's going to be a fair amount of indoctrination going on. Um, yeah, so. but a lot of the Christians that are coming over from Syria, mm-hmm. they're actually they, they're coming over because they act, they really really believe. Everybody in Germany is a Christian, mm-hmm. and they're really happy to come here because now they can be Christians, mm-hmm. and mm. they're way <clears throat> more Christian than people I know. Are way more churchy and way more into yeah. their right. Yep. So okay, well, I don't want to bore you any more German stuff. <laughs> but it's, no, I mean it's it's, uh, it's very interesting too, uh, and. Like a glimpse into life that that we don't get to see over here a yeah. lot. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, I think it's interesting. It's interesting that all the, that a lot of young people are are kind of stepping out. I I, I realize that now, mm-hmm. and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a very hopeful sign. Uh, and I think we are uh, pretty much out of time. So uh, thanks yeah, a lot well, for your call. Yes. As a last call out and. Um, Keep it up. It's always fun to watch you guys. And uh, I have plenty more to watch on YouTube. Yep. To make right. up for this. Thank you very much. Right. We appreciate you watching. Okay. Thanks. See you then. Okay. Bye. 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 All right. Uh, that's our show. And uh, I want to take a special moment to praise the crew of the Atheist Experience who have been doing an awesome job. Yes. I mean, if you saw Matt's uh, tech episode a few weeks ago where he just talked about all the stuff that we have to deal with because we've made this enormous step of moving through a publicly funded uh, professional TV studio to this place where we're just throwing equi- throwing money at the problem and, and coming up with new equipment, and there's something weird and different every week. But this week, we have phone lines that work. We have so yeah. many phone lines, such good callers. The call screeners were doing a great job. Uh, this deck that I use to see the callers is amazing, and the only thing that went wrong with the show today was I stupidly forgot to turn on my own microphone. <laughs> so... 
Thanks, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Jen. Thank you. It was fun. And uh, the Atheist Experience will be back in a week. And for now, in Austin, uh, you can meet us at Threadgill's North location. See you later. Bye.